thanks uh, for inviting me to share the story with the Sooner Safer Happier community. Uh, so did this uh, presentation initially in August, just recently at Agile Australia. So great to be doing this uh, presentation again for those who may not have been there um, or who just were simply interested to hear, to hear the story again. Um, so I'm Catherine Drury or just Cat. I'm one of the Agile coaches at Roche Australia. I've been with Roche for 18 years now. Um, so I uh, have a good understanding of the business from uh, multiple uh, different areas and experiences. I used to work in the clinical organisation before coming across into um, this role as the organisation started our Agile um, journey about four and a half years ago. Let me just share my screen. Okay. So originally for this presentation, um, I did do the presentation at Agile Australia with our general manager, Stuart Knight. Um, and so when I'm sharing the leadership experiences, they're some of his experiences, but it's also consistent with experiences we've seen from leaders across the organisation as well. So just wanted to, to share that context um, up front. So for those who may not be um, aware or know much about who Rochar or what we do, we are a global healthcare company founded in Switzerland 125 years ago. Uh, today, we have two core divisions. So a pharmaceutical division, which I'm part of, as is Stuart, and also a diagnostics division. Um, our medicines are at the cutting edge of technology and we supply over 30 medicines into the Australian healthcare system. They're typically specialist hospital medicines in areas such as cancer, neurological disease, and ophthalmology. And as a global company, we're also characterized by having one of the world's largest R&D spends. And we're typically listed in the top 10 investors in R&D. Last year, we were in position number eight behind Apple. Uh, so for those who have heard of Roche and some of this journey, uh, we did share those initial experiences back in 2021. I think it was in the, the peak of lockdown. We were going to present at the conference and then it became an online circle and then we did present as well. That recording does, does still live in the, the inter, in the internet. Um, so if you Google Vimeo and Agile Australia, you can actually go back to our original recording as well of what that initial journey was like. Um, and that journey was sharing how we all took, uh, all globally in the pharma organisations undertook that Agile journey initially. Um, and so this presentation is building on that one and really focused on sharing the learnings that we had along that way um, over the past four years. Some of those challenges, which we still, which we still see and try to solve for, um, and also the benefits we've been able to realise. So for those who may have been involved in a number of transformations, um, you certainly have that bit of lag effect, I would say in terms of realising some of those outcomes and impact as well. Um, and so um, this was this next part. So we started locally and we were really empowered uh, to have that um, local perspective and do it bottom up as a global organisation, so over 100 countries. Um, but what we saw is we weren't quite getting the full impact we wanted for our people, our customers and society. And so this is where we then looked at, okay, what does scaling start to look like for us as an organization? So that's what we'll be covering today. So in sharing some of these experiences, uh, or sh I will share a brief history of the journey, um, how we scaled and those experiences from a leadership and coaching perspective. So what you'll leave with is personal experiences and not just the good. I'm sure we've all been to presentations where we hear all the good stuff of, of how it works, but we'll, I'll also be sharing some of the challenges. Uh, the benefits we're now having to our healthcare system. And also, um, lastly, just share that um, we've actually stopped using the word transformation and we just talk about how we work. Uh, so probably a bit of encouragement to consider um, that as well. So within Roche, we have some ambitious goals. Um, and over the course of the transformation, we've certainly learned 
the importance of having an inspirational North Star to really create that focus and activity on. Uh, so I'm probably preaching to the converted here, but for those who might be earlier on in their journey, just want to recommend that clear vision to engage hearts and minds of the people is really key. Part of that, though, is the what also needs to be clear, and that's something we certainly heard um, continually on our journey. And when we say the what, it's really around what are you trying to achieve through adopting a different way of working? Without that, for some people, it can be really hard to, to come along that journey. So for Roche, why we started our journey was because we wanted to become more externally focused and really put patients at the centre of everything we do. We wanted to use our resources purposefully so that growing sustainably over the long term can contribute to the Roche 10 year ambitions. Um, and in many ways, five years ago, we got we actually had this through some research. We were completely paralyzed by our, by our own internal processes. Um, they'd become too complex. So we were getting feedback that was just we were difficult to work with. Great innovative medicines, difficult to work with. We also wanted to embrace, create, and respond rapidly to disruption. Our ability to predict what was going to happen in even three to six months was proving difficult. So why write a three-year three -year business plan? We certainly saw and experienced that soon after during COVID. Um, and lastly, we wanted to create an environment to unleash the power of our people, to free up their time to focus on the things that really matter and empower everyone to take bolder actions and increase collaboration. Very aspirational. We've certainly made some progress on a number of those areas. So in 2019, so this is starting to, what was that journey like to go through? Um, each country was encouraged to just start the journey, uh, to play, experiment and learn. Uh, what, what was it like to work in Agile? And so over 100 countries, or you may hear me refer to them sometimes as affiliates, is it's how we sort of describe our different country organisations. We're all enabled to do that in the way that fit best for our local ecosystem, recognising that each of our countries was unique in different ways. Um, and we were able to make some really great progress. And with some, you know, different sent we had some local initiatives and then we had a couple of centrally led initiatives, which then also became really critical to enabling the local components as well. Key example of that is global finance, which I'll share later on. Another part was also a common leadership approach, which was really key. As we were continuing then on, you know, learning what worked and, and understanding what it was like to work in Agile and starting to get rid of some of those complex processes and bureaucracy, um, we found that in a global organisation and working in a networked way, some things just weren't working when we were all doing slightly different things. Um, and so back then, our networks were more about communities of interest or communities of practice. And so we'd often just share completed work with our colleagues in the organisation. And for a period of time, that was fine. Uh, stealing with pride was a new concept for us. Um, we certainly still talk about it and use it today. Um, and we found successes where we were starting to work more closely with countries that had similar healthcare systems, such as Canada, New Zealand, and the UK. As the global organisation continued on that journey, this is where we started to come up some, with um, some of those, I guess, barriers in thinking around cross-country or cross-border initiatives, because we were doing some things slightly different. And so in 2021, uh, what we did as an organisation was to actually curate all those learnings across the world. Um, we saw that there was a variety of uptake in those initial agile transformations. Some countries had achieved quite a lot of progress, and certainly we like to think Australia was, was in that category. Others seemed a bit more reticent, perhaps less convinced, and didn't go as far as, as other countries did. And so we took that step to literally take that step called uh, 
are scaling together exponentially for patients. And so this wasn't about reinventing the wheel of, um, okay, what we, we now do globally. It was recognising all the components that were working and that could be scaled across the organisation. And that focus was to ensure that we could break down those geographic boundaries and begin to fully leverage the power of network. And so those initial, so as I mentioned, some of those initial agile transformations certainly had benefits. So I'm just going to share a couple of these now, because this has certainly been, a, I guess, a cornerstone to how it's really shifted how we work, especially in Australia, um, from a financial perspective. One of these was the adoption of Beyond Budgeting, um, and that radically shifted our financial management. So for those who haven't heard the term before, because I have learned that some, some people are unfamiliar with that, it's where traditional budgeting processes are abolished and they're replaced with things like dynamic capital allocation, rolling forecasts and distributed financial decision making. Now, what that means for employees um, is no more bottom-up budgets um, and our employees are empowered to invest with impact. Now, this takes time to shift the mindset, um, including those of our finance colleagues. But I think that was one of the key components where it needed to come from leaders for it to really work. Um, and so I think it was almost overnight, a lot of that those processes were abolished from a global perspective. With that mindset and what we now see, though, is we've got four years of no quarter four hockey stick effect. Um, some of you may be experiencing that right now. Uh, so it, it definitely has a broader impact beyond just a financial um, investment piece as well. Um, because it, what it starts to happen is it not only starts start to shift how you might invest resources, but also how people resources are able to move more fluidly as well. And also the ownership and um, perspective of, of the people working in the organisation. So as we started on this journey, you know, I recall a team where they were really passionate about some priorities and gaining additional resources to work um, in their area from another team. So having that conversation with that fluidity in mind. Now, once we had transparency of the other priorities across the business, and particularly for that team to see that, their perspective shifted too, um, because they were like, well, actually that team will have a broader impact than what we wanna do, so we don't need it. So you start to see the enterprise mindset grow across teams, um, and that creates a broader impact because they have a greater willingness to shift that more fluidly and dynamically. Now, that doesn't come without its challenges. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll share those challenges in the next slide. Another key um, area where we've really seen some benefits is new collaborative partnerships. And this has unlocked un opportunities we previously may not have identified and certainly would have been able to realise. Now, whilst that comes with um, challenges in navigating you know, new scenarios, new legislation, lots of different um, different areas and complexity, it does unlock greater outcomes. Um, and this is where we found as we continued on this journey, a lot of the work starts to become more and more complex. So helping people understand that context is really, really important. Now, as a result for us, we've now entered into two public-private partnerships with government and academia. And so it started to shift that relationship beyond transactional, much more into partnership and a partner in the delivery of sustainable healthcare. And that's a fundamental change we wouldn't have been able to do before, um, not only from not being able to identify it, but because we were restricted um, previously by, by a traditional PNL and budget. So without that constraint, it starts to enable and lock other opportunities. Career journeys. So I know that this is um, a oft discussed topic in agile communities is 
how does how do people have career journeys in a flatter organization away from a traditional ladder um, and this fundamentally looks different and so it's about rethinking that and identifying different ways to grow capabilities um, and experiences so um, now this isn't for everyone and that's okay and I think that's really important to acknowledge not everyone will like this and we've certainly had people leave the organization and that's great that, that's fine because they did want that traditional experience. Um, but as an example, we all now have broad position descriptions, but we may only focus on one part at a time. And so actually it's then around growing your career experiences through different projects or different capabilities you'd like to build. But that includes also leadership as well. Okay, but yes. It naturally comes with some challenges. Um, and sometimes these challenges can be difficult to predict um, or they might come up as just unintended consequences of something else that may or may not be working. This first one goes back to that um, financial component or empowering people to make decisions. And we certainly saw that um, highlighted from a financial impact. What we see is empowering people to make decisions does not necessarily mean they want to make decisions. Um, and so, for instance, from a financial perspective, there's a big difference in the willingness to take accountability for $20 versus $20,000, regardless of if it creates the same impact. Um, or in the other side, people may want to make that decision without actually recognising it may need further consideration or have further implications outside of their expertise. Um, and so it takes time to really embed this and real clear intention to not only embed it, but also learn from it um, and enable the team to have these discussions right at the start of who is the decision authority or decision maker and what decision making model are we using for this? Um, having that discussion at the start accelerates the delivery then of the work. Now, we employ incredibly smart people as an organisation, uh, many of whom have or continue to work in roles where information needs to be correct. We work in a highly regulated environment. And so shifting to principles over process can be quite daunting uh, for those colleagues. Uh, and so it's things like they might hear, stop it, stop that piece of work. That's not gonna resonate for them. <laughs> they can't stop their work. Um, and, and so I think there's different nuances there in terms of how you, the language that is used with different parts of the organization, uh, but shifting into that, that learning really needs to be balanced with celebrating the achievements along the way. Where, where there's usually a lot of process, it can be really hard to think around the small achievements and it can actually start to force people back into some of that perfectionistic or process mode or we need a process to solve for this as opposed to a conversation or collaboration. So it's really important to celebrate um, the, the wins along the way. And particularly as people then start to broaden their um, understanding or the, and that enterprise mindset, it's really important and critical for leaders to reward and recognise the behaviours they're expecting and asking of people. It's fun. To, you're asking people to do something quite different than they have done before. And if that's not being rewarded, it can be a real challenge. Um, and particularly when work starts to become more fluid, it's really important to consider the impact of what is achievable but also where someone's sense of belonging comes from. After all, we're all human. Um, and so if you're working then on different projects or getting different experiences, they might be capability related or leadership related. Um, it's really important that everyone is then being recognized for where their work is being done. Because what happens, you either risk um, over capacity in order to deliver something on time or you may get delayed delivery of work. So it's really important to understand the nuance of someone's sense of belonging if they're now working in a more fluid way. 
I think the other part with transformation is it's really important to pay attention to also the things that are working and not just what isn't working um, because it might just be something ne that needs doubling down on or a small tweak um, that actually has a greater impact or, take, or, or taking something away uh, rather than trying to solve for everything. And I think that's a key part is don't try to change too many things at one go because you may not realise which one actually had the impact. Okay, so that was the initial part in terms of the journey and some of those benefits and challenges um, and uh, where we then started to go to is we recognise that we can have greater impact as an organisation um, when we start to think about things with the power of, of the network, as we call it. So in scaling that, it's certainly more than just agile. And so while agile practices continue to be the basis, you know, it all starts and ends with the ecosystem um, and how work gets done. There's a lot, you know, a lot more different aspects as well. And I think the one thing that we continue to see is that we're still more common than we are different. And so the customer continues to remain at the centre. And what we've discovered is being intentional around resourcing around outcomes um, is, a, is a key component. And so a team will always need elements of stability. However, greater impact can be achieved when you do enable the right resources at the right time to actually flow to the outcomes that matter most. And so that is more than just sharing learnings. It's actually identifying common work and doing that work together from the start where you can. What that means is reducing duplication and longer term starting to accelerate that knowledge transfer because people then know how to deliver some of that work. Now, this is, this is difficult. We're still on that journey, but we're certainly seeing growth in this area. Um, and this is where we've learned over time. There's a real balance in the behaviours to enable this but also the right architecture. And when we say architecture, it's not about structure, it's around collaboration. Um, and so enabling this isn't just about outcomes, but also how we understand our people. And when we say our people, that's beyond our teams or countries and enabling those career opportunities. Uh, because what you then start to see is people have more career opportunities without having to leave their country. So it actually broaden, broadens up other opportunities. And so with this stability and flexibility, um, and as we sort of shared when we scaled, it was really understanding what some of that balance looks like and that architecture, so collaboration. It's not about having rigidity. It's about what are some basic foundations that are common across all so that when we are working together, everyone is understanding the way that work gets done. And so as an organisation, we have some really key basic foundation, foundational principles that how work gets done and how, how we um, work as an organisation. The first one is VACC leadership, which is visionary architect, catalyst and coach. Now you can Google that, I believe there is a white paper um, on the internet about that but that is our leadership approach and so it's not a traditional manager who directs plans or tells it's about enabling the environment in the organization for, for people to thrive but it's not just leaders it's everyone every you can lead from any seat and so um, it can you know look different it's not just that traditional if you've got leader in your role a second key part, and I think this is certainly underpins a lot of it, is our outcomes-based planning approach. And this enables us to decide what is the most impactful work and how we collaborate to achieve this. And so embedded in how we sort of really understand what is the context we're working in, what are those conditions, or how do we ensure um, we're really focused on delivering the work that is will have the greatest impact. It provides that common framework that helps you make trade-off decisions and enable resources to flow to impactful work. Now, many of you may be familiar with OKRs. 
Now with OBP, this is where we look at not just sort of how we think around outcomes and measuring them, but this is also how we integrate the role of VACC leadership in enabling and empowering teams. Harnessing the voice of the customer. Um, OBP is not a cascade, it's an alignment. So what's happening from a global perspective in terms of strategy um, or, you know, a, a, we're at the end of the day, you know, an organisation, but recognising is what is happening in, with our customers and our ecosystem as well. And that helps us to then think around how we deploy our resources fluidly and invest with impact. So it's bringing those components together. Um, and lastly, our operating principles. And so this helps us make decisions about the work we're doing and how we're doing it. And so it is a different way of thinking and working. It takes time to learn how we work as an organisation, but we actually now see people joining us for the way we work, collaborate and the impact we have. So this is just a snapshot in sharing those operating principles that help us make these decisions. What you'll see in these operating principles is a number of polarities. So you'll see lots of ands in these sentences. And so even as we work with these, it's typically more than one principle will be um, relevant in considering the work we do. So for instance, short and long-term. We want to make impact now and think long-term. Um, so this is something we, we uh, work by in helping us make decisions as we progress forward. So what's it like working in this way? So we'll just share a couple of experiences now from a leadership perspective and also a coaching perspective. Um, so this was, um, you know, in the Agile Australia presentation, Stuart shared his experiences, but we see this experience quite consistently across our leaders as well. Um, and so I think something that is consistent in a number of their experiences is that it's completely different to compared to how they used to work. Probably to, if for a, a lot, it took more time for leaders to adapt than the rest of the organisation in parts. And they definitely at many points in time wondered what we were doing <laughs> um, as an organisation. But I think what you also hear is that uh, they wouldn't go back to working in a traditional organisation. Um, and so when we talk around a networked organisation, we are a decentralised uh, organisation. And so we are, we do work as a structure of, um, of a network of units or teams. And this is often uh, country based in our country affiliates, but it can also look different. Our financial component, we've got quite a decentralised organisation. Um, but this is how when we focus on common outcomes as opposed to a traditional centralised hierarchical structure, this breaks down that traditional thinking of how work gets done. And so, in fact, our Australian affiliate is part of multiple networks, depending on the commonality of outcomes. And so in a networked organisation, leaders are part of the crew. Um, and that means they may have then responsibility for other areas than their traditional role or, or um, accountability, um, even for a GM, this has shifted. One of the key challenges we've seen over the years with leaders um, is having to work with all these contradictions or competing polarities. I hear this uh, quite a bit from, from other organisations as they go through this journey. But it's things like, do I empower a team? Do I need to be more directive? Do I value the network more or the local more? Um, and so it's important when working in a complex environment to not actually choose one or the other or try and solve for it, but actually embrace the polarities and shift to both and thinking because there's likely benefits from each applicable to the situation or um, context. Lastly, part of that VACC leadership, leadership model is the, the word A or the letter A being architects. Now, this doesn't mean we're constantly restructuring. What this does mean is how we organise ourselves and how work gets done and when. And so it's around collaboration, outcomes and purpose-built networks clustered around those outcomes. 
And so this is where this polarity of stability and fluidity, which I've mentioned, comes through. Um, and from a leader, uh, when they're looking at a broader systems view, is where is that stability needed and where does fluidity create greater impact? So from a coaching perspective, uh, my role has certainly, uh, I would say, evolved over time with the Agile transformation. You know, initially it was Agile values and principles, Scrum or Kanban or all those things, um, but that's certainly grown over time as, as we look at more enterprise uh, perspectives and views as well. And so you do have a much broader systems view, even within a country, um, because as you're working with these different networks, you're looking through multiple dimensions internally and externally through different uh, lenses of the system. And so even we will flow to areas of, of work we, where we can have the greatest impact. This might be with a multicultural team. This might be with a team that's co-creating externally in the ecosystem. And so as a coach, it's really important to always take that step back, look at the different um, perspectives or um, lenses of the system that you're working with, uh, because that becomes really important in setting the team up for success that you might be working with. So as an example, currently spend most of my time in one of these newer operating models, working across the model and with two teams that are based across 10 different countries in Asia Pac. I spend some time working with an Australian team that's focused really um, on co-creating externally uh, and other time spending time, you know, global leadership experience. And so you constantly work thinking around the different dimensions. From a network perspective, you're also looking at the system of how collaboration happens. And so you become quite important in how you're connecting different elements of the system together. That might just not be, that might be people, but also learnings to enable that next growth curve. Um, and so it's then not only sharing those learnings, but how do other parts of the system build on that and start to maybe solve for things that may still be a barrier in, in current models. And that culture of continuous improvement and innovation uh, through reflection, it really does rely on psychological safety. That won't be new to anyone on the call, I'm sure, uh, but it is certainly embedded as a shared accountability for everyone. Everyone in our organisation goes through psychological safety training, uh, and that includes how they help to create that for themselves and others in teams. So that's a key fundamental piece that's throughout the organisation. Um, so you might be also wondering, what does this mean for our people um, and also our customers as well? So at the start of the transformation, we heard plenty of concerns from our people given we are working in a highly regulated environment. Um, and we know across many industries, this sentiment still remains. So in terms of our experience, so firstly, for our customers, a couple of years ago, um, after the initial transformation, we had a regulatory audit. And so not only did we have no major findings, but they actually loved the transparency and clarity we had across the organisation. Four years in, we now see even greater impact with higher quality and faster speed than our industry peers. We have multiple examples of doing this work doing more faster than our industry colleagues. For our people, um, we especially saw this through COVID, um, we were, our people were able to actually adapt faster. And we were, at the time, we were actually doing a prototype in a couple of, of the product teams and a couple of the functional teams. And when we went into lockdown, we actually saw these teams adapt much faster than the teams working in a traditional way. And so what this has meant is that over time, and we see it increasing year on year, is they're able to adjust to new complex problems with an increasingly growing mindset of curiosity, enthusiasm to pave the way, and are able to understand the benefits of the change. And that will become increasingly more important as we start to implement new 
and novel disruptive technologies. So what this means for us now is that we no longer talk about transformation. It's just the way we work. Um, and we will continue to adapt and evolve where we need to, to adjust to our ecosystems. And this is something we do as we continue to evolve. We look at what's working, what's not, and identify what iterations then need to be made as we continue forward. So thank you for, for listening. I hope that was helpful. Um, but just to wrap up and share a couple of key takeaways or top tips. So number one, identify how your organization currently collaborates to unlock how learnings are shared, adopted and scaled with speed and efficiency in service of the customer. Number two, as a leader, embrace polarities. Don't try to solve or manage them. Embrace both and and create the environment that enables employees to grow their career experiences. And number three, as a coach, help people grow their adaptability through understanding how context constantly changes through each growth curve and enable the quality of the collaboration across the network and externally. Thank you. Um, hope that was helpful and interesting. Um, happy to take some questions. I'll come off viewing screen so I can see everyone. Thanks, Catherine. That was um, that was awesome. Um, so there is a question from Ryan, or a couple of questions. Did you want to pick uh, one of them, Ryan, and get us and get us started? Uh, in any order that you want, really. Sorry, I'll just go to the chat. Did you want me to, is that easiest? Easiest? Okay. Um, should, we, should we start with the first one first? Could you elaborate on transformation is just how you work? Like what, what you mean yeah. by that? Yeah. yeah. So uh, this is where I think over time, uh, what we noticed with people, you know, initially we were learning. So we called it an agile transformation. Um, and then as we scaled, it was still considered, a, you know, the next part of transformation. But what it then, uh, the experience people felt was, well, when does transformation end? And it became difficult for leaders to answer that question because the environment itself will continue to change and evolve. And so it was actually, again, this is this part of stability and flexibility. Um, and so how we work is that we will adapt and evolve as needed, um, but not using the word transformation because we now have the foundations enabled um, that indicate or uh, in, in itself is we will adapt as needed, but not just for the sake of it. Okay. Um, what things did you drop in the process that didn't work? Okay. Um, so I think when we first started, our first, uh, we, we had some, different. I think, three different areas where we initially got started. And what we did was have a design team from the organisation solve for some of those challenges. One of the first areas we started with was uh, the business planning process which we called Agile Planning. Um, we actually got rid of all business planning processes as they were. Um, this saved us 180 days of time and thousands and thousands of slide decks. Um, you essentially got rid of an entire financial process um, and business planning process. So this freed up a lot of capacity. One of the challenges with that, though, was people then thought because the process was removed, the rigour around how you get work done was also gone. Uh, so we certainly, the pendulum certainly swings. Uh, and so it did take some time to get some of that rigour back. Uh, but that certainly, you know, is, is back uh, now. But it's interesting how some people think that when you get rid of some things, it means the entire thing as opposed to the principles that may sit behind it. 
Um, um, can, but, just, sorry, sorry to interrupt. I, I know I've written too many questions. If you feel that there are too many, just yeah, feel free to skip those. Well, I wonder, um, there's a follow on, John, that you've just popped into the chat from that discussion around the um, the what you've done with funding and annual planning. I wonder if we just keep if we go with that one next to to keep it together. Yeah. Um, go for it, John. John, did you want to um, say it out? Yeah, and then preface that. I, I think you you were you were just edging into that that topic. I think as I was typing, I, I wonder how significant do you think that change to beyond budgeting was in enabling the wider ways of working change? You were saying you know it freed up hundreds of days and powerpoints and going through that process myself at the moment um, and even having had a conversation back in April at a global strategy event in, in our company about we need to scrap all that and move to a more adaptive approach which hasn't happened um, yeah. I, I, I do wonder how um, how much of a change that is a catalyst for you know freeing the organization from a whole bunch of stuff and being yeah. able to really focus on a wider change yeah i would say it's incredibly significant <laughs> um Stuart and i are reflecting on this agile australia we're like we still think actually um that was a key catalyst because you start to see mindset shifts as a result you start to see um people reinvent their roles so as a result because you're not doing a bottom-up budget um you just have one number so um, we in the Australian affiliate we have one number and that's what we you know there's no um, siloed investment in teams there's none of that there's just one number that we work towards um, and from yeah. a global perspective it's similar there's just one number from each country and each product that's it and so it frees things up hugely because you've got a lot more flexibility but it also catalyzes that mindset around impact because you start to actually, you stop all those behaviors of I've got budget, I need to spend it, otherwise I won't get it again. Or I'm going to do this activity because I've got budget I need to spend. And so what you actually see is once it's initially implemented, um, your spend actually drops because and people are no longer. Global, <laughs> how did the global finance community kind of galvanize itself around beyond budgeting that it's kind of it seems was, to be the key exam question where, where does that idea come from in an organization and your cfo or whoever go we're gonna do that that's a great idea it came from the cfo yeah so i think with that was a key part was um it was the the cfo who said we're removing all of the um the financial planning in terms of what they capture from the affiliate now, each affiliate or each country certainly um, went to different scales. So we still have a number of countries that do some, some level of bottom-up budgeting. Um, so it really then depended also then on the local CFO as well in terms of how far they wanted to go. Um, I think Australia is still probably the one country that went the furthest, and we can certainly see those benefits. But globally, um, they got rid of a lot of that as well. They just take a snapshot once a year uh, with a number, and that's it. Catherine, that's I feel like you're lucky. You. Most most <laughs> finance people are the ones that need convincing. So, Lonnie, you've got a question um, that's related. Did you want to ask yours? If you can, pop yourself off mute. Or I can ask it. Um, oh, there you are. I'll ask it. Um, how did you get the um, the the buy in from the CFO and then from the execs? Was um, it his so, idea? Was it someone's idea? <laughs> how did that happen? Yeah, and so this was so our then CEO. Um, he read uh, "Reinventing Organizations" by Frederick Lalou. And that was the, the impetus for the change. And so he started that conversation with leaders before any of the countries started to transform and said, we're doing this. Um, and so I think that was the certainly the, the strongest catalyst because it came right from the CEO. 
Um, and so that was a, a critical component. And the CFO was really, you know, forward thinking around, okay, finance needs to be part of this as well. And what we've also then seen that was really then important is helping the finance community reinvent their role. So um, it was actually then helping them understand what opportunities they then had in um, shifting the way they work. So rather than looking at spreadsheets and month end and all of that, they're now looking more at trending or, you know, we, we do something across the organization or certainly in Australia and across the organization called investment retrospectives. And so, yes, we have our, you know, traditional retrospectives. These ones are purely um, financial and activity based. Um, and so we've got a way of doing it where we actually blind the, the financial value. The team will come together every six months to have a discussion and think around the impact that those investments had. We unblind the numbers then and start to look at, okay, which activity had no value and we're not going to do it again and we're going to stop that. Which activity did have value and we would do it again and why? Um, and so that's become a practice uh, across the organisation. So our financial um, people have really shifted their own roles more in terms of, you know, the agile practices and what worked and what created impact and then looking at trends going forward. So it helping them to reshape that and help them think through that was definitely important. That sounds like a ninja move to uh, remove the emotion <laughs> by putting the, by blinding the activity. So no one, you know, feels like they're going to lose whatever they're passionate about. <laughs> a nice one. Exactly. Everyone loves their own idea. <laughs> so we've got a question, Eric, you dropped it in the chat, maybe uh, five or so minutes ago, but around change management activities and, and helping leaders stay the course with the change. Did you want to ask it? Go ahead. I like the reference you just used to the CFO drove a lot of the change because he had the right mindsets. But before you mentioned that there was a fair bit of resistance and you had to keep the leaders um, sort of focused on the North Star, what, what was those interventions to get them to change their mindsets, stay focused, and when things got really difficult to just keep experimenting in that growth mindset? Yeah, great question. Um, and so... As, le as the leaders sort of started prior to the Agile transformations, um, they all went through, uh, you know, bespoke program that had been developed to not only roll out the VACC leadership model, but we also use creative leadership as our model as an organisation. So the leadership circle uh, for those who might be familiar with it. And so interventions around their leadership in and there's two spaces of the circle, creative and reactive. So there was a lot of focus then of what are their creative leadership behaviours? How do they lead from that place? What does VACC look like? And so they'd have regular, um, uh, certainly initially, a, a program to help them understand how that connected with agile practices and why it matters. Uh, but then also going forward, there was a lot of leadership forums that they had so that they could share those challenges. Uh, we also had a central transformation office with a small number um, of coaches as well who would help help through that too, um, because it certainly did get challenging. So lots of lots and lots of dialogue around, hey, how are you trying to solve this? Hey, what are you doing? Um, we also initially, I think for the first probably two years, we had lots of series of inspiration tours or speakers where particularly the leadership teams would go to an external agile organisation and just start to understand it, experience it and learn from others who had gone through that change as well. Thank you. So Ryan, I've had a quick look through the other questions that you had put out there, and I think we may have covered them. Are you okay with that, or is there anything else you wanted to ask? You're okay? All right. Oh, they were um, pretty much covered. Thank you. Okay, beautiful. Gretel, did you want to ask your question that you just popped in there? Hey, yeah, sorry, I've um, got uh, mouse controls. Um, 
Thank you for a really um, interesting uh, share and real real life stories as well. Um, cu- I'm always curious, how do the coaches share learnings across teams and across the organisation? And were people even receptive to other people's learnings? Mm. Yeah, great question. Um, so by heart, a lot of our organisation are scientists. So we love a good experiment. <laughs> I think that definitely made it easier. Um, But part of that was, particularly from a coaching perspective, was helping people to connect the dots of what they were learning was critical um, in that change. But then we've always, as a global organisation, typically in our functions or some of our teams, we always know or connect with our different colleagues in the different countries. Um, and so it's quite common in the different uh, roles or or teams to have that connection with the other countries, regardless of um, this was even existed before the change. So you'd always connect with, oh, what are Canada doing? Because this healthcare system is really similar. Um, so we, a lot of us already had those connections, um, but then we continued to build them. And so we'd have on a regular basis around, hey, what are those learnings that you're starting to see? What's working? What's not working? Certainly in um, like in APAC, I think we would connect once a month to share our challenges and our pain points. We start to then identify areas or opportunities where we can connect. And we continue to do that to this day um, and across the globe and just sort of sharing that. But we we have and we have systems as well that start to to capture that. But it's all it doesn't be connecting with the actual person and talking through it. Okay, thank you. So maybe to um to wrap it up, the what maybe one question for me is what are you thinking next, Catherine? So you've spoken about all the things that you've done. What's what's next in terms of the improvement? What are you thinking about? Yeah, so at the moment we've just started um, one of the more recent operating models. We still call even within the the different networks a different network operating model, um, and we've started that across APAC for our oncology disease areas. Um, and this is where we have um, what is it? It's twelve twelve countries but we know there are certainly common pieces of work that we all do. And so um, what we've been focused on is sort of scaling that approach to share what is that work being done so that we're only doing it once. But part of this is then also connecting in with some of the, the global teams because it's also, again, around clustering around these outcomes. It may then just be an outcome that's specific to a country, an outcome that's specific to a cluster of countries, or outcomes that are specific to multiple countries. And so it's actually having transparency and understanding of where the work is being done, how it might be phased, particularly in different waves based on ecosystem and healthcare systems. So rather than, hey, it might not be ready for us now, but we can get that work in two cycles time. So how do we ensure we just take that work so that we don't redo it and duplicate it? So going forward, um, it's sort of continuing to sort of scale that um, learning that approach, but then including the components around people build knowledge. How do you accelerate future work by then transferring some of that knowledge, i.e. the person to that work, as opposed to just the learnings and then someone else starting from scratch. So that's probably where we're going next. But I think that's been a key part is also understanding what is the people, what is what is uh, someone's experience in working in that model? And that's where we learned there's a, there's a sweet spot for how people then focus their time in terms of capacity for network and local that has a big impact on their engagement, their experience and delivery of work. So that's what we're currently testing is if we got that sweet spot right (laughs) in terms of how they are dedicated to different parts of the work. Um, So that's something we're we're 
collecting data on as we go through this new operating model to see if we would then scale it even further. So, that, so that's sort of our approach now is we experiment, we've got really clear the hypotheses we're testing, we collect the data, and then we look at should we then scale it. I can't wait for the uh, the the presentation in six months' time, Catherine. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. And um, if we've got thirty more seconds, one last one from John uh, is based on all your experience at Roche. How has that helped you to improve ways of working? So I'll just ask it for you, John, if that's okay. Yeah, great question. So um, I've actually worked now. We think around a decentralized model. I've essentially worked in um, four different companies <laughs> within the same organization. Uh, so I worked in the global development organization in an Asia Pac role for many of those years. Um, I spent time in San Francisco in our early development unit. Um, and then this is um, my first commercial Australia role, which has now shifted into the network in any case. Um, what's been really key, um, and this was a decision we took uh, globally, was to recruit um, coaches internally because of the nuance and understanding of the business rather than hire coaches externally and build the capability in advance, oh, sorry, um, build the uh, industry knowledge. Some countries tested that and it was very, very challenging. Um, and so we we made a conscious decision to actually recruit coaches internally because, and this is where we certainly see the benefits now, because they're able to have um, different types of conversation, particularly from a industry understanding how um, healthcare systems work, but also the business acumen component to really drive delivery of projects. So that's definitely helped me. Otherwise, I wouldn't understand half the discussions the team have. We use a lot of acronyms. <laughs> Don't we all? That's great. Thanks, Kat. Beautiful. Well, we might uh, say thank you, Catherine. That was amazing. Um, I think on behalf of everyone, thank you for that. And thanks, everyone, for joining. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Until thank you, next time. Thank you.